Hey, Kevin here, Skylabs, bringing you another video. Definitely going to be a fun one. We're gonna be looking at my top five holy grails. And fortunately for me, I've already obtained one of these that we are gonna show you in the video. I've got two on my list that I am definitely looking for. And there's another two that I just really wanna experience in person at some point. I really don't have actual hopes of owning two of these pieces. This is essentially kind of my ultimate dream list in a perfect world where money wasn't an issue and rarity or scarcity wasn't an issue because with any holy grail, that's usually what's involved. They're usually expensive and they're usually rare. And every one of them on this list definitely fits that category. Let's get into the list. Let's go check out some grails. I'm really excited about this one. For those of you out there that don't think I have a personality, Let's get into the list. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Here we go. And the first one on my list, and definitely not in any order, we have the JBL Paragon. The Paragon was introduced in 1957 and discontinued in 1983. Its production run was the longest of any JBL speaker. And at its launch, it was the most expensive speaker system ever created. And in 1957, that JBL Paragon would have cost you $1,830. And just to give you an idea on the size of the JBL Paragon, it's 106 inches by 33 inches by 24 inches. And it weighs 850 pounds, according to JBL's brochure. And JBL admitted themselves that these were not easy to make. In 1960, they estimated about 112 hours per JBL Paragon cabinet. And from the looks of these, you might think they're just maybe one of those older consoles that your parents or grandparents used to have. And that's not the situation at all. This is a left and right speaker in one housing, essentially. It's not a mono speaker. You do have two speaker inputs for left and right. Each side has a 12 inch woofer, a horn loaded mid range, and the bullet tweeter that JBL fans know and love. And with me with the Paragon, this is one of those that I don't feel like I would need to own. They're very expensive. Even today, I think, you know, you're looking at 30 grand for a JBL Paragon if you can find one. If you've got a really nice mid-century house and you've got the budget, I do think the Paragon is the ultimate stereo speaker system in that environment. And since I've never heard of Paragon, I don't want to come to the conclusion that they're more of an art piece or a statement piece rather than a viable speaker system. I don't think that's true, but you can't deny that the looks, the construction, and the design don't play a part in the history too, you know, in, into the desirability of these iconic JBL flagship speaker systems. It intrigues me enough that I definitely want to sit in front of one of these and experience it for myself. From what I understand, a lot of people say they kind of remind them of like a, a corner horn a uh, clip system where the sound is kind of all engulfing. It's around you everywhere. And I, I assume that's from the, the horns being reflected across that front baffle. That's just a guess. According to Wikipedia, there's a rumor that Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra both had three of these Paragons. They used them in a left, right, and center configuration. And that they used them to listen to playback from their latest record. And while it's fun to think about that maybe being a reality, because you can imagine the type of parties that were going on in those rooms, you know, who knows if that's true, but it did make it into Wikipedia. So there you go. I know where there are a couple in the United States and I've had offers to go listen to them. I want to make sure that happens at some point. It's just not one of those type of speakers that you're going to randomly fall into going to a garage sale or an estate sale. People don't just set those types of things aside and put boxes and clothes on top of them and forget about them. Those pieces get seen, they get used, or they get sold. And the next one up on my list is the Sansui G33000. The 33000 retailed at $1,900 in 1979. This is a 300 watt per channel receiver. There are some other really cool things about the 33000 that are unique on the monster receiver list. One is that it's a dual mono construction. None of the other receivers on the monster receiver list are dual mono. 
The other thing is the G33000 is kind of a chameleon. It's actually not technically a receiver and it's not technically a separates unit either, but it can be both. You can separate the 33000 by the amplifier and the preamplifier and tuner, or you can combine the chassis together and make one receiver. So actually there is quite a bit of debate regarding the G33000 being on that list with the other receivers. I honestly would kind of lean against it being a receiver because most of the time when you see these in people's homes, they have them stacked. They have the two cabinets separated and they have the preamp and tuner sitting on top of the amplifier. And while I'd love to stumble on one of these in a garage sale, the odds of that happening are obviously very slim and purchasing one outright, even close to retail. A lot of times when you see these pop up on reverb or eBay, you know, they're looking at 20 to $30,000. At least that's the asking price and, uh, 20 grand for a receiver on the low side. It's not happening for, for this guy. And on top of being a Sansui fanboy, the G series is my personal favorite series of the receivers for me in sound quality, build quality, and, and in the aesthetics and appearance, that's the one I go for. It, it hits all three for me, sound, looks, build quality, win, 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 and the G33000, that's the king. And so, you know, if you have one of those, enjoy the fact that you own uh, one of the coolest receivers, in my opinion, at least that's ever come out of Japan. And the next one up on our list is the Infinity IRS fives. This is another one that I don't have any intention of ever owning. And fortunately, as far as I know, Paul McGowan in Boulder, Colorado at PS audio still allows people to come in and listen to his Infinity IRS fives. And that is something I definitely plan on doing if I'm ever in the area. Honestly, I'd like to get there this year. The Infinity IRS speakers came out in the early 80s. The fives came out in the late 80s. These speakers are ginormous. They are huge. They actually weigh 1.2 tons. This is not something you just go out and purchase and hope it fits. These speakers are massive. And each side of the Infinity IRS speaker system has six 12-inch woofers, 12 EMIM mid-range, and 36 emit tweeters. And I think for anybody out there that has experienced the emit ribbon tweeters and the emim mid ranges, you know how good those things sound, how detailed they are and how smooth they are. I love those mids and tweets. So sitting in front of that many of them, giving you a kind of wall of sound type effect, which is what I imagine this sounds like. I can't imagine being disappointed. I think it would be a good enough of experience to get on a plane for just to sit in front of these things. And if you're looking to get a pair of IRS fives, uh, there is a pair on eBay right now and they're 80 grand. So if you got that kind of money, go for it, nab them. Let us know what you think of them. I kind of have what I consider to be the poor man's IRS speakers. I have a Macintosh stack set of speakers, which is the the XR 19s and the XR T 20s, same idea, actually older than the IRS. This one has two columns of tweeters and then two massive cabinets on each side that house the woofers and the mid range. And in all honesty, that Macintosh system that I'm talking about gives you that kind of wall of sound. It's a really unique experience having that many speakers playing music at you at the same time. I can only imagine that the IRS fives are that same kind of effect, just taking up a few notches in quality. You know, I'm not bagging on those Macintosh speakers. They sound amazing, but they're not IRS fives. And the next one on the list is another Sansui. And I really didn't want to do this. I, I almost put some other things in place. And then I thought, you know, I want to be honest. This is my real list. I would have liked to give in a different product besides Sansui, but what can I say? I really like Sansui and the Sansui BA 5000 was made between 1975 and 1977. This is a 300 watt per channel amplifier going into either two, 
four, or eight ohms. And the reason for that is this is Sansui's only amplifier that had output transformers on it. And since the Sansui can run down to two ohms, essentially, there isn't many speakers out there this amplifier cannot drive. Now that's not the main reason I want one, although that is really nice. Obviously you don't have to worry about speakers dipping down too low and hurting the amplifier. This thing is just gonna hum along like it's nothing. It's no big deal. I like this amplifier for the design, for the looks, and I got a feeling it probably sounds like my AU-20000 with more power. And I love the sound of my AU-20000. Their choice of highlighting a lot of these pieces with that kind of maroon or burgundy red case, I think is really unique, but I think it works really well with that black face plate and those monster rack handles. I just don't think you can look at this amplifier and not see how well it was made and not appreciate it for its looks. If you hate it, you know, not everybody can like the same thing, but to me, I think that's the best looking amplifier that came out of the seventies, including Macintosh. <gasps> so, you know, take that for what it is, but you know, when you're looking at spending that type of money on a piece of equipment, if I owned one of those, it would be the focal point of the room. You wouldn't walk into the room and not see that. I might have lights shooting on it and stuff just to be like, you know, hey, I've got a BA 5000. What are you running at home? What's in your rig? You know, one of those types of things, even though nobody ever comes over to my house. Fantasy world again, but so is owning a BA 5000 for me. And in all reality, this might be one of the more achievable ones for me. I do see these priced around five to six grand uh, when they do come up in really good shape. And that's a lot of money. I'm not, I'm not saying that's chump change, but you know, it's, it's not what some of these other pieces on this list are getting. And the next one on my list is the one that I have actually obtained. And that is the Gerard 301. I said Gerard and everybody was right out there on that one. I'm still going to say techniques. I don't care but I am gonna change the way I say Gerard. I always thought it was spelled G-E instead of G-A. And uh, so last night I was sitting there and kind of putting this video together and, and I looked up pronunciation and I noticed it was G-A. I'm not a reader, I'm not a speller, I'm not into grammar at all. I don't think anything on this planet interests me less. It's Gerard, there's an A. And I've got a great story about how I got my Gerard 301. So after we get through the nuts and bolts, I'll share that story with you. It's pretty cool. And the Gerard 301 transcription table came out in 1954. This is a rim drive or an idler drive. They came with a diagram on how to build your own plinth or the size of the hole you would need to cut in your desk in order to put your 301 in. A lot of radio stations use these, even the BBC. You have to think for a table that came out in the 50s, there hadn't been a lot of advancements. And this turntable, when they're restored and they're working properly, the speed is dead accurate. This is a quiet turntable, even though it's an idle or a rim drive because of the, the weight of these things. The total weight is 16 pounds. And I think six pounds of that is the platter. And that heaviness is gonna help reduce that rumble or those vibrations from that motor being that it's being spun by an idler drive. A lot of people kind of compare the looks to a VW bug and I, I definitely see that. You know, do I think there are better turntables out there? 100%. But for a turntable from the 50s that still performs as well as they do when they are restored, and I had mine refurbished by a company in Boise, Idaho, called Woodsong Audio, and they did an incredible job. This is one of those turntables that I'm not just gonna hand over to anybody, you know, and hope they can work their way through it. This is a, this is a piece of equipment that you send to a specialist, to somebody that really knows what they're doing and only maybe works on that model and a few others. So that's why I sent it to them and I couldn't be happier. My turntable is dead quiet. It runs like a top. And the fact that it's still usable and could even go toe to toe with some really good turntables out there, it just makes it that much more enjoyable for me. You know, playing records on that turntable, my mind tends to go through a 
where's this thing been? You know, was it in a radio station? Who's all used this before? And did they get the same enjoyment out of it that I am right now? The Garrard 301 is definitely a holy grail. It's also a really important piece of history, all kind of tied into one. You know, some of the cool things I got with my, my 301, you know, this is the original check sheet where, you know, somebody was doing quality control, gave you the measurements of how my specific turntable performed. And the manual it comes with is actually a, you know, a bound book, you know, it's a hardback book showing you all the different specifications and how to set it up and how to build your plinth. And that goes to show you the level at which, you know, they made these turntables. These were a professional grade turntable meant to be as accurate and good sounding as a turntable could be in 1954. And again, is still relevant today. Okay, so now for the story of how I got two Garrard 301s, I had just opened. And one of the best things about having a hi-fi store with a phone number is you get calls sometimes like this one. And what happened was I answered the phone and he said, hey, I'm in Panora, which is 40 minutes northwest of Des Moines. And he said, I just emptied a house that's getting ready to be demolished. The original owner had a bunch of old stereo equipment. Are you interested? I'm on my way to the dump. And my response was, of course, send me some photos. A few minutes later, I get a photo of this old beat up truck and it's got a topper on it. You can barely see anything in there because stuff is just piled in. But I did see two things. One was a Marantz amplifier. I believe it's the 20 or the 150. It's the little guy. And then the other thing I saw sticking out was what looked like a 301. So immediately I said, absolutely. Why don't I meet you halfway? I think we met in Adel. And so I went to Adel. I pulled over at our meeting spot. He pulled in. I walked to the back of his truck. I looked in and not only did I see one 301, but I saw two and a bunch of other stuff. It was packed. There was even a Jensen uh, duet speaker. I, I just said to the guy, well, you know, what do you want for everything? I don't want to pick through this. You know, you're getting ready to throw it away. What do you want? I think I ended up getting it for 250 bucks, everything in the truck. That doesn't happen very often. At least that's never happened to me since, but I ended up getting two, uh, Garrard 301s out of the deal. I got one refurbished. The other one I'm going to send off and have that one done at some point, because what I think I'm going to do is make a, a mono deck as well, because later going through the other boxes that were in there, I ended up coming across some really cool tone arms and a couple new old stock mono cartridges. Just real quick, I'll show you a couple of these tone arms I'm talking about. I got two of these, and these are old Pickering tone arms. You know, this was such a simple device in that essentially this rod came through the base of the plinth and attached this tone arm just like that. That's as simple as it was. And this is a mono cartridge on there. There's, there's only two wires coming out of it. And the other thing I got in the box was a neat tone arm, not neat as a neato, but the brand neat. And, uh, I think I'm going to use that one. I've just been holding on to these, these two pickerings, you know, waiting for something to arise where I need them. Definitely one of the coolest purchases I've ever made, especially out of the back of a truck. I really felt pretty lucky that day. You know, I should have bought a lottery ticket, but I didn't, but I felt like I won the lottery. So I probably didn't need to. Definitely jump down in the comments or some of my grails the same as yours. What ones do you have that I didn't have? I don't expect everybody to like the picks on my list. Every list is going to be different. These are just the ones that I'm the most excited about either getting or experiencing at some point in my life. And it's nothing more than that. So there's a lot of amazing equipment out there. I wanted to throw a Nakamichi Dragon on the list just to kind of appease some of the people that have been asking for cassette decks. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to do it because I've never had an Akamichi Dragon. We've never serviced cassette decks at Skylab. So uh, hit that subscribe button. It really does help the channel out quite a bit. And uh, we'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Another video. This is definitely grails. And in all reality, <clears throat> Jesus.